Hey everybody, welcome to Glitchy Pancakes, real talk about the world of fandom. I'm Jesse. And I'm Rob. And today we want to talk about the World Science Fiction Convention, better known as Worldcon. Joining us to talk about all things Worldcon, uh, Bill Longhorn is a DC area fan and convention runner. In addition to chairing the 2009, 2014, and 2019 Capclaves and the 2021, uh, which just happened, he was on the committee, performed various duties for the 2010, 2011, and 2015 Nebula Awards, on staff for the 2003 and 2014 World Fantasy Conventions, as well as co-chairing the 2018 World Fantasy Convention. Uh, it's currently co-chairing the 2021 Worldcon Discon 3. Bill Lawhorn, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jesse. Oh, Robert, great to be here. Yeah, glad you could join us. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Always good to talk about conventions, uh, tell stories, <laughs> just like the, just like the bar. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. The convention people, bar. <laughs> people that are involved in in uh, running conventions, you know, there's just there's the number of hours we could spend discussing it. It's really it's it's unlimited. <laughs> um, but for, and there I have guess been for, hours. There have been hours upon hours <laughs> upon oh, hours yeah. of discussing cons. <laughs> And it, you don't start that way and you end up that way. <laughs> right. I mean, that's why there's literally a convention called SmofCon, where yeah. the convention runners go to talk about running conventions. Yeah, um, it's, yeah it's a con runners convention. I still haven't been, but that's, that, that's on the list. Cause... Yeah, virtual this year, along with many other conventions. Uh, everything else, yeah. But you might want to consider 21 if uh, things are open. It's, I believe it's going to be in Lisbon. It happens uh, late in the year, right? First weekend of December, typically. Yeah, but Lisbon, yeah, I mean, shoot, give me an excuse to go to Lisbon. <laughs> um, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, for people who aren't as steeped in the con world as we are, uh, we might as well give them a little <laughs> intro into the um, World Con, which is technically the World Science Fiction Convention, most commonly known as World Con. So for those who don't know much about it, um, what is World Con? What makes it special? So World Con is a general science fiction convention with a little bit of everything um everything except at this time uh like tv personalities there's not right. really media but authors are authors writing um are typically the big um draws for the convention the world con is also one of the oldest science fiction conventions running yeah. first ran in 1939 and wow. has been run there, ran for a couple years and then took a break during World War II and has been back continuously since then. In 1953, um, they started giving out, they gave out the first Hugo Awards. Uh -huh. um, the Hugo Awards are kind of the Oscars of the science fiction writing community. Yeah, uh, definitely. And that's one that's of the big good. perks because members of Worldcon uh, are allowed to nominate and vote for who will win in the numerous categories. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, th and that's, uh, <clears throat> they are, yeah, you say it's like the Oscars of, uh, of um, science fiction. It, well, in, I wanted to point out too, that, um, Worldcon typically includes, it, it's referred to as the World Science Fiction Convention, but there's a lot of, uh, it, it goes beyond, it's, it's not confined to the boundaries of science fiction in terms of genre. Yeah, it's science fiction, it's fantasy, historical fiction will come in. Plus there's like, um, one of the, some of the things we're planning is we're planning science presentations. Hmm. Um, oh, cool. So Dublin uh, hosted Worldcon in 2019, and you know one of the one of the awesome people I got to meet there was uh, astronaut Jeanette Epps. Oh, cool! That's cool. Um, yeah, so she was amazing. She's a DC area. She's been from. She's spent time in the DC area. Has family in the DC area. So she's really hoping that we're able to be in person so she can come up and attend. Although we totally accept if she misses it if she's going around the planet right, right. there's a chance she'll be in space at that time so we're like yeah we'll we'll accept that but you know maybe we can uh, maybe we can download you and have you come in on zoom or Skype right or <laughs> yeah we understand there'll be a little bit of a delay <laughs> and they had it's it's happened before uh cal lungstrom uh an astronaut i believe in he either it was either in 2015 or 2016 that he actually um came in from space during the convention that's pretty wow. cool um, that's pretty wicked and so like that's so science and so science you know major science presentations will happen we're hoping to you know we've got some connections with nasa the goddard space center is really right here so there we're hoping for some good displays and stuff with that with them as well as other federal agencies um one of the things that 
is, is pretty cool. And it's probably not going to be, we, it'll be something we'll set up before the convention is trying to see if we can make some opportunities to set up some tours to go to the library of Congress. That's cool. Oh yeah. Uh, the library of Congress is a beautiful building. Uh, there's so many little hidden things within it. Uh, but like the other thing is that we're looking and hoping to do is um, working with a, one of the destination DC tours screw tourism board in DC to set up and arrange for some buses on Tuesday before the convention starts to get people out to the Udvar Hazy Center, which is where the space shuttle is at, the SR-71 Blackbird, the Enola Gay, a bunch of the really big, wow. cool uh, air and space items are out there. And one of the things we're really hoping to do is with our, our NASA connections is try to make sure that we can get one of the shuttle era astronauts to go out there during the time when we're taking people out there to do talks about the missions that they were on next to a shuttle. Uh, that's a value you added. Richie. That's right. <laughs> that's value probably as cool as you can get. Value right added, there. yeah, and that's really. Yeah. Like, it sounds like it really take like you're putting a lot into making it like not just a, um, not just an experience where people show up to the convention and that's the entirety of the whole thing, but like you're right. really you're using your setting in DC. Oh, like, yeah. Absolutely, experience. we are about three blocks from the National Zoo. Okay, and remember the National Zoo, we have a new panda cub, unnamed. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Um, so that's that's really cool. We have a you know, we were all hoping that the she was pregnant and stuff, and she was, and she she just had the cub not too long ago. So the cub will still be there and doing more stuff the next summer when we're live. Um, fun story. Um, <laughs> so one of the things that happens, you know, when after we won, um, twenty twenty one discount three will be one of the things that you do is besides doing the Hugos is you help choose where the location will be in two years after your, your convention. Mm. And so right now there are two cities that are currently buying to host the 2023 convention. There's the Memphis bid, um, which is run by some friends of some people I know here in the Virginia area there, they got a really nice deal. Um, and Memphis is really happy to work with them. And then there is uh, the Chengdu China, is uh, mm. bidding as well and they're they're like the science fiction center for china um all the china wow. a lot of actions there and so last last year november um a group the um the groups that are organizing the, the bid invited s- several of the convention runners to go to china for the galaxy awards oh, wow. and when we were there Chengdu is also the center for the giant pandas. So <laughs> I got to go there, go to, we got to go to one of the, you know, the preserve that's right there in Chengdu. And we got to see like hundreds of pandas, <laughs> red pandas, giant pandas. Uh, my wife teases me that uh, I am such a great photographer. I got all the panda butt you can imagine in my book. <laughs> 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 Which, it happens but like so then later on we were there a few of us went out to a different preserve and we actually saw the first panda taishan who was born in dc and then after three or four years went back to china and so he's like 15 or 16 now so we got to actually see him in his new home and they actually said that he was one of the most active pandas for his age which was surprising and we were there he was actually kind of patrolling his space (laughs) <laughs> that's kind of fun like you got to, you ran into an old friend <laughs> yeah so we totally took some pictures and stuff and my my coach here colette fazard was there as well and we were there and i'm like it, it was one of those things we were going out there and i asked we were asking the tour i'm like so are, are you the dc pandas here and like oh yeah they got really excited that we knew about the the dc pandas and stuff so it that's was actually at the time cool. when the most recent prior to the new one had, was going back was you know last november is we went over there right when he was being transferred back to china so yeah yes. we got to do that and you get you get these little experiences and that it, it was it was just really cool with the getting to see the pandas so with the the panda tie-in is for the national zoo being so close um one of the things they've been doing recently is a lot of times in the morning they'll have like walks with the stars so like authors will go on walks with fans through areas so like in 2013 when it was in san antonio 
um, Lone Star Day convention, they were right on the river walk in San Antonio. So they were taking the, the authors were going on walks with their fans in the morning down on the river walk. So we're thinking we might end up, we are right on the rock Creek park parkway. There's a, there's a um, park there where there's walking bike paths, but we're also close to the zoo. So we might actually have people going up to the national zoo as kind of their part of their part of their walks. That's pretty freaking cool. Yeah, yeah you're trying a... to work in these things, and like, right. we'll, we'll, you know, assuming we're live, you know, we're going to try and talk to the, talk to the zoo more carefully, see about if we can get somebody to talk about the, the panda breeding programs and the breeding programs at the national zoo because they've actually been quite successful. Right. So, right. Yeah. So you know, we don't just read science fiction. We we like science too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, using using everything that's around you is um is, is pretty cool. It makes it makes sense, um, especially since there's so much history. And I mean, when you when you're going into science fiction, history ties into that, and you know, science also ties into that as well. So why not you know bring it all together? You know, uh, try to get that um inspiration. Mm-hmm. Um, let me ask you a question. Um, how is each 42. world con forty two? Forty two. That's the answer. Is the answer? That's the answer to everything. That's the answer there. Okay. Okay. Hitchhiker's <laughs> Guide to the Galaxy. Right. Know? Right. 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 Sorry. It's, it's, no. No. It, I was about to go. I was about to go sideways there and say, "Okay, now see, now I know you're a fan, so now we have to talk about." This. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get sidetracked. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, welcome, it's fine. No, it's fine. The conversations with me. <laughs> this, this was going to happen eventually, since we're all fans of science fiction fantasy. It's going to happen. It's oh, no, going to happen. We're gonna we're gonna find something that we like, and we're going to go off on a tangent about it. And it's okay. This is what we do. We talk about fandom. This is a part of it. Yep. Um. How how um. <laughs> I can't stop thinking about that now. I'm gonna be <laughs> telling people that from now on. How um how is each uh, Worldcon uh, location decided? So that actually was we were kind of talking about that. Um. Anybody who is a member, right, of that of that year has the right to vote in site selection. Gotcha. So like this year, um, when it was down in New Zealand, although it was virtual this year, there was only, there was uh, a bid from Jeddah, Saudi Arabia and Chicago. Right. Members. So that's both attending members and supporting members. Okay. Get the, get the right to vote and choose the, the next location. So the thing about that is when you're voting, you've got your membership. Mm-hmm. And then what you do is to vote, you pay for an advanced supporting membership. Okay. So no matter who wins, if you vote, you've paid your advanced supporting. Whoever wins, you are then a member, at least at the supporting starting level right? Um, for, for whoever wins. So gotcha. everybody who voted this year is a member, uh, you know, is a supporting member to start with for Chicago. They can then upgrade at a, at a, better price but the the main thing is, is that they, they they become part of the family where they pay you know they pay and vote and say where they want to be so they're so, kind of like they're literally invested in it at that point like right. yes and, and it gives a little bit of support probably for the winning bid it shows them that there is support for this that people are already coming on board and, and helping to fund yeah. it yeah right. it, it definitely helps um so Worldcon went through, of course, some, some wonderful, wonderful times in drama, no drama, everything's cool in 2015. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and, you know, we won't go into why, but um, what happened was, you know, they had, because of the voting situation for the Hugos, mm. they went from about typically, you know, maybe 1,500 supporting members to like 5,000 supporting members. And then wow. these are people who paid $50 to vote in the Hugos to ensure certain things didn't win. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And, people trying to but, hide the process. And what happened as, in, as kind of an ancillary, so you had all these extra people who were involved in voting and their site selection that year was between four locations. Um, there was a, a, a site in Japan, Montreal, Canada, Helsinki, Finland, in Washington, D.C. Um, there were about 2,500 votes that year. Um, Helsinki won first round with 13, a little over 1,300 votes. D.C. lost with over 800 votes. Um, that is the highest ever losing total <laughs> for, for a location. Um, 
800 plus votes would win has won more times than than not than more times you get 800 votes you're good it just right, not like that this. year um there's some things that came in so but just all of a sudden you just had this huge influx of votes because you get that advanced supporting and it's one of those things where once you you start once you've already become a member you get that advance it, it kind of keeps rolling so you're not it's not a hundred dollars to be involved it's really only 50 after that first couple years once you get your the the, the role going on because you're already right. a member you're just now another, another member that makes so, sense you just kind of so keep- the, depending on where it is you not only you make that initial investment of 50 bucks to to get your vote in but then at the same time you have to look at flights oh, and yeah. hotel rooms of like four different places three different places or how many people are in a pool and decide <laughs> how to get there when to get there and why and those those are you know um people look you know they look at the committee who's who's going to run it mm-hmm. um you know they're, they're, one of the things that happens here is you know in normal times there's conventions that are happening every weekend right and fans who are supporting these these cities get out to a lot of these conventions and they sit at fan tables and they talk about what they want to do if they win they talk about who's on their committee they talk about exciting things about their city you know so like you know when kansas city was running in in one in 2016 they talked about barbecue Mm -hmm. kansas city barbecue um so th- there's also another little thing that happens is when um, the World Science Fiction Convention is outside of North America, there's another convention that's run in the U.S. or in North America. It's been typically in the U.S. called NAS- NASFIC, the National Science Fiction um, Convention. And, you know, they what happens, you know, they had it in, it was virtual this year, but in uh, 2010, um raleigh north carolina no charlotte raleigh Raleigh. no it was raleigh my wife my wife bailed me (laughs) out there um raleigh hosted the um the nasfic when uh, world con was in australia Hmm. and the as part of their bidding thing they were doing barbecue wars they were bringing eastern carolina barbecue western carolina barbecue and so they were giving it out at their parties to that so like some of the parties and stuff that are hosted have some specialized foods and things like that to try to interest people. Um, yeah. Sometimes there's specialty drinks. Um, so and sometimes there's just you know some bottles of soda, some cheese, <laughs> meatballs. Right. You know, it's not it's always good. great. They can't. Right. They can't all well, be winners. <laughs> well, and like um, Chicago 2012, the the group that was running the bidding, uh, they were doing hot dogs. Chicago dogs. Chicago dogs, right? Yeah, that's fair. I mean, it's kind of right. associated with the city. They can't even smell. Sh- they can't smell hot dogs without getting a little sick right now. <laughs> <laughs> Just probably- all the parties they did, they were boiling them because that's really oh. how all they, you know. So like they, they just yeah. Now, <laughs> now mind you, conversely, like New Orleans when they for their bids recently, they were doing like red beans and rice. Mm. Oh man, oh, that man. was good stuff. That's, I would think if there was any city that was bidding for a world con that was going to use food as part of their bidding stuff, it would have to be New Orleans. I mean, that's just Orleans, right. it's such a food town. Like that's, right. and it sounds like the whole the whole deal when people are you know when they have a bid out for uh, for world con, it does sound like there's a lot of effort put into like uh, not just the committee but also the actual location. Like we mm-hmm. want people to know like to know why this city is a good place for this, why it's going to be a good experience, um, and that's what you have to offer. Right, right, and it's probably—I mean—it's one of the one of the few actually, uh, actually that's a traveling convention you know, that, that yeah. changes uh, locations. And there have been some outside of the U.S. Uh, I think there are a lot of people that are interested in seeing more of them outside of the U.S. Um, and which you know, that's we'll see if that happens because there's a bidding process. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. And so, like, you've got you know, recently until recently, um, twenty-three actually had three cities. Nice, France was also bidding at one point, but they're there were some changes in the mayor's office and it just, it, it, they're like, Nope. But now 20, 2024 Glasgow is yeah. bidding. Um, so like they're, you know, nobody has come up against them at this point. Um, mm-hmm. Although had there not been a, a little thing that happened, there would have been a heck of a bid, a, a thing for 24. What's that? Well, 
DC actually originally had planned to bid for uh, 24. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. We lost for 17 and we we're kind of reformatting and we picked 24 because that would be 50 years since the last time DC hosted Worldcon. Mm. Oh, okay. Makes a lot of sense. Right. Nice um, so, yeah, that would have, it would have been, um, it would have been, it would have been war. And uh, <laughs> I actually had the Pablo Vasquez, who was the chair of the um, Puerto Rico NASFIC a few years ago, um, had, I had him talked into, he was, we were going to do a full on war of 1812 theme. <laughs> All right. And he was gonna he was gonna come in as George Washington. That's cool. Uh, <laughs> we, we we would we were gonna arrange for the fife and drum and the flag and nice. you know since uh, you know the, the British are coming the British are coming and <laughs> um, you know fun. I mean the thing is we know we know all the convention runners in uh, Europe and stuff that are looking mm-hmm. to run Worldcon and stuff like that. So I mean it had been it had been relatively jovial, but it'd right. be serious too because you know spend a lot of time and effort i mean you know, we you know travel to 10 10 you know a con or two a month um yeah. and you know that's a lot of time a lot of money um because you know like there is some money that comes from the pre-supports that people give to the bids to help them go but a lot of money is still coming out of pockets like mm-hmm. yeah um occasionally the bid will pay for a room for a party, but a lot of times it's a party's hosted in somebody's room. So you travel to a convention, you get two or three nights of hotel room. So, you know, there's three, $400, you know, four or $500 right there. Plus you're, you know, you may get reimbursed for the snacks and beverages and stuff you do at the party, but yeah, you know, you're still, you got that 400 plus the travel expenses, the, you know, basically you walk in in the morning, you set up the table, you're there till six, you run, scramble, grab some food, set up for the party, and that's what you're doing till like midnight, one o'clock. Mm-hmm. Now, mind you, people come to you and you get to hang out, and you you know, it, it's it's fun most times, but the, it can be it's can work be raining, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's work. That's that's what I was wondering about is like what are what are some of the uh, the challenges that come with you know with this being a travel uh, traveling convention, having each annual Worldcon planned and run by a totally different group of people. Um, what? it's not totally different okay it, it'd be nice if it was because i think one of the things we actually talk about is there's some burnout that goes on mm-hmm. with some of the, the upper level staff because there's a lot of people who carry over year after year and you know it's hard like it can be hard on people i i very purposely i had enough commitments for other things that i didn't get involved with you know staffing in prior world cons but collect my co-chair she like she ran the Wispus division, which is like the core things. They do the um, business meeting. They do the Hugo nominations and balloting. They do the site selection balloting. So that division does all that stuff. And she did that. And then she co-chaired. Uh, she ended up vice chairing at Helsinki in 2017 and 2018. She didn't do as much that year, but like so, but she was involved, I think, with the Wisfus division. So, like, you know, you've got people, and like, um, so several of our upper staff people have been three or four world cons in a row, they've been in an upper level position. We okay. have some people who haven't, which is good because you know, it's a, it's a pretty good time commitment. You know, you've got monthly meetings, plus you know, monthly group like division head meetings, plus you have your own division staff meetings happen, you know, yeah. once, almost weekly and it kicks up more. Yeah. So and you'd want to have some, uh, have some fresh ideas coming in too, like not just have the same, because people do want to see it be able, I mean, this is the one uh, next year in DC is the 79th Worldcon. And yep. while people do like, you know, there are traditions, there's value in, in certain traditions and then they get carried on. You know, it, it definitely seems like people want to see fresh ideas and they want to see uh, even something that's been around that long, you know, stay, um, stay with relevant. what's going on, you know, stay relevant, stay relevant. You know, yeah. keep, a, keep an eye on what's going on. I mean, look to the future, so to speak, you know, like people. Well, and that that's, part of that is about staffing and finding the right people for the right jobs. I mean, one of the things Colette and I spent a lot of time talking about is, you know, how will this person mesh with the rest of the group? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, we've 
we've seen conventions where there's disagreements between upper staff and it feeds, it filters out and it's, it's not, it's not good. It, right. it doesn't create a welcoming environment mm-hmm. um, for staff and it, you know, it puts a lot of pressure on them. And, you know, the one thing is we, you know, we promised that, you know, we would try to, we would make decisions if, if they came, we would, you know, communicate, make decisions, communicate them. Or if in the rare occasion where we can't agree, we'll go back to the original staff and say, all right, we're going to trust you to do what's right. Yeah. Right. Um, and, you know, and the other thing is, it's like, we are really fortunate, I think, um, Lisa Adler Golden, who is involved with Balticon and the Baltimore area, um, agreed to do program for us. Mm-hmm. And Lisa is very forward thinking on program, not bound by tradition. Right. Yeah. Um, she'll respect it and she knows there's a place for it, but like very willing to go out and take chances. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, their program committee right now for the brainstorming group is like 50 people. Right. That's a good... And yeah. And, you know, but, you know, and the thing is she's been very good about um, recruiting diverse voices mm-hmm. um, to make sure that we're, we're considering all aspects of fandom and mm-hmm. science yeah. fiction and that we're not stepping ourselves. Um, right. Yeah, because that's a real challenge these days. Is yeah. you know you get, you think you're doing the right thing, and you've got blinders because mm-hmm. you just don't see it. I mean, we all have blinders as as guys. If I mean, it, like for us to write, if we were trying to write a, a female character, we would need to go talk to women um, about writing that that mm-hmm. that woman character. I mean, we wouldn't be able to do it. I mean, we have blinders, and we can't fully understand. How to do that so it just makes sense to have you know more voices in there that understand different aspects of the things that we love so that we can you know shop to them and get all the things out there that they love and right. you know keep the fandom going it's and the only way to do it the other the other thing is that very cognizant about panel makeup mm-hmm. who's on the That's panel yep. um you know and one of the things that um works for us is we're looking at there's a we're planning to use a variation of the Zambia system reg- program registration system that was developed um, in the Northeast. And the nice thing about that system is you input all of the program descriptions, names into the system. And then your panelists go in and they can see each of those items. They mm-hmm. can click the ones they're interested in. They can give it a ranking of one to five as to how interested they're into it. And then the most important thing, why I should be on this panel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like, you know, it'll happen is you'll have people that you've known as, you know, I've, I've done plenty of programming for conventions and you'll have people you've known for years, but like, I don't, I, I may not know that Jesse has a 500 car matchbox car collection. Right. Well, and it's like, and, but, you know, we're having this thing on, you know, toys. And he's like, well, I've got this 500. And like, Holy crap, I didn't know you had that. <laughs> and, and, like, this gives them a chance. Or, you know, I studied, you know, I studied um, ancient Mediterranean, Mesopotamian culture in college. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't know, you know, if, unless, you know, I, you know it's, unless something comes up on a regular basis, you just don't know it. Right. Um, so it, it, it allows you to better match people in panels. Um, and so I think that's like really, that's one of those really cool things that's been developing out there is ways to better match people within the systems. Yeah. And it, it also, um, it's, it's good to hear that um, your particular Worldcon committee has, has the understanding that we, that, that so many of us do have those blinders that we, that we mm-hmm. grew up with and that do keep us from seeing um you know, the entirety of it, it that, that's how things get missed uh, at, at various conventions about the, the topic of, you know, how a topic description is written or what a panel topic is or who gets placed on oh, a, panel about a certain thing, because a lot of times it's just, it's simply not thinking about it. So to recognize that that's going to happen, if you don't put some effort into keeping it from happening, a lot of effort, 
you know, it, it takes that work and, and it's, it's good to hear that your group realizes that because then you have the, you know, a large group of people that you're consulting about how to make this work um, and not just assuming, Oh, well, we got this and we got this, we'll get it right. And without, you know, without looking outside. So one of the things um, that happens is this goes back a few years, 20, 2015, we were up in Saratoga Springs for world fantasy convention and Anne-Marie Rudolph from the Baltimore Science Fiction Society. I, I'm with the Washington Science Fiction Society. These are uh, association. These are two different groups in the D.C. area, mm-hmm. not the Baltimore, Washington area, Worldcon Association, wah, 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 um, <laughs> which is running Worldcon. But the two organizations, WISFA and BISFIS, got together, and we put together a bid to host the World Fantasy Convention in Baltimore in 2018, which is the one I ended up co-chairing. So we're in Saratoga Springs in 20, uh, 2015, and world fantasy was going through some issues at that point. They, that was about the time that they switched from the Gahan Wilson, Howard head and made the call out to get the new world fantasy trophy. And that was all that stuff was going on at that point. And, you know, we're there, got the word that we had, our bid had been accepted mm. for, for 2018. And so I was there in the bar talking to, some of the loudest voices and the most concerned people, because I knew them from other conventions. And I'm like, look, mm-hmm. this is what we're doing. My goal is to be proactive, mm-hmm. not reactive. Right. So would you be willing to join our committee to help us do it right? And yeah. the answer was invariably yes. And so we, we brought in people who were concerned. They were passionate about the convention. And so they made sure, you know, they, they, they kept us on the straight and narrow where we potentially could have gone off the rails. And, you know, we, it was after the convention, I was chatting with one of the Kellen Sparrow, who's one of the, one of the people who'd stepped up to help us. And we were talking and they, he, he said, I'm like, well, you know, you didn't get everything. Like, no. Yeah. We didn't get everything. We got like 80% of everything we wanted. And you know what? That was good. Because mm-hmm. you know there, there were some just some things we we couldn't do because it didn't didn't quite fit didn't work. But it was that like a lot better than not even having had the conversation and right. not having a voice at all. Right. Yeah. And so like when you see the the flare ups, you know we had you know the there was the write up on kind of the recent problems with world fantasy, and you go through and they're talking about this year and that year and that year and that there and they're like well not 2018 because they took the time they did all the stuff we thought it was turning around at that point. And mm-hmm. so, and that's kind of taking that experience um, that we had in 2018 and attaching that to the Worldcon as well is that, you know, proactive, not reactive, and double the staff expectations. Right. Yeah. I mean, more staff than you ever think. It's natural progression. And congratulations right. on that. Congratulations on finding, uh, uh, on doing, on, on trying to, put forth that um that message out there because it is a message those are the same people that shape awards i mean in speaking of those um <laughs> hugo hugos. awards right yeah. the hugos so like let's get into that a little bit um, <laughs> um they're the highest event i mean it's the biggest thing at worldcon it, right um could you tell us some, people for, for most people, people for most people because there, there is the masquerade <laughs> the masquerade that's um, right. There's a master level masquerade that happens. So right. for some people, that is the high. That level. is the thing. Yes. Um, right. So there, there's so there's little things for everybody. There's certain right. There's certain things that you know, for some people, it might be oh my god, the Hugos, we got dressed up, we did all this. That was the most amazing thing. For other people, you have to remember, the thing was is well, I got into the coffee clatch mm-hmm. with, um, you know, for me, I, I got into a coffee clatch with Eric Flint. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've, I've chatted with Eric Flint, and but you know what? Got to sit there for an hour and chat with Eric Flint and eight other people. Right. That can be for a fan the most amazing right. thing. That can be the thing they take away from the week. Right. That's Absolutely. Right. So you, you, it's it kind of the you know user experience. But yeah, no. But let, let's let's be honest. Hugo's is the big thing for the most time part. Well, it let had me, to qualify. Right. Let me let me rephrase it as one of the biggest things. Absolutely. One of the biggest things <laughs> at, at Worldcon. Could you tell us about the Hugos and what it means to the science fiction fantasy fandom community? 
So this is one of the things, you know, this is an award that's given out by the fans. Mm-hmm. You know, so in some sort, maybe it's the People's Choice Award because the people, people, people too. There are, and I should know off the top of my head how many categories are. I don't. Um, <laughs> but there's, you know, there's things for, you know, there's, there's categories that specifically award fans. Mm. There's right. fan artists, there's best fanzine, there's uh, best fan writer, um, you know, there's semi pro zines, there, and then there's also things, you know, there's the best novel, which is like, the big one that's you right. know, it's like the the best picture it's a big the big one is the best novel but then you know there's 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 a novelette novella and short stories there's so right. there's four categories for and actually one of the relatively new categories is the best series um yep. which hmm. is only a few years old and was put in because there was a concern that so much of modern writing is the series mm-hmm. and it's an opportunity for some of those long, longer term activities that may not have get, get noticed right away um, to get some recognition. Mind you, it hasn't completely played out. I mean, I fully expect at some point that um, like the 1632 Ring of Fire series or the Wild Card series mm-hmm. will will get get in there because they've been going on for 20, you know, like 20 plus, you know, 20 years for the ring of fire stuff, the, you know, 40, 40 plus years for the wild wild cards. cards. Yeah. You know, there's some big expansive universes and well, and you know, let's face it. um, When uh, Lois masters Bujold won for um, the Vercasian, that's a long, long running series. Yeah. um, That's, you know, well-respected and has done, you know, when you go back and you read, some of the first ones it's like she had a she had a disabled character who was the main character Mm -hmm. in the in the was the 80s early 90s i mean but like before that was normal a normal part of fiction Mm -hmm. she had a a character who was undersized had genetic disabled disabilities and like so it was quite the um forward thinking Um, right as I mean, in my personal opinion, as speculative fiction ought to be, I mean, by, right. by definition, even uh, should be more. Well, it's kind of funny when you think about that. It's like, um, if you read some of the military science fiction novels, the futuristic military science fiction novels, they actually have a lot of forward thinking things in there. You, you look at them, the relationships, there's a lot of polyamory right. in, in the future. You know, they're, you know, like cloning is, is a big thing and like relationships are, are different. Uh, and so it's not as conservative as you might think or expect. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, and, but, you know, there's, there, there's opportunities there and I, mm-hmm. for, for those categories. And then there's, you know, the, the Astounding Award, which is for the best, um, best new writer, right? Best, yeah, new writer in their first or second year. Um, yeah, best really? related work, which is an interesting yeah. one, because um, mm-hmm. that's that's pretty broad ranging. Like uh, that can bring in some really interesting stuff that doesn't necessarily fit yeah. handily into one of the other categories. Right, that deserves to be recognized. You know, and that right. Can... And, then, and then there's the best best presentation, the best dramatic presentation, short form and long form mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. movies and TV for that for that fandom. Um, so you know, there's there, there's a little bit for everybody, and you know, there's um. You go through and you have, you always have, there's some good stories that happen in there. Um, everything that went wrong with 2015's Hugo's, mm-hmm. there was one really great thing that came out of that year. So, uh, DC area, Baltimore area fan artist Steve Stiles, who had been nominated more than Susan Lucci, <laughs> finally won a Hugo. Wow, you know he like twenty plus times he'd been on the ballot and hadn't won, and that year he won his Hugo, and mm. sadly he recently passed away from cancer. Um, but you know, and it was one of those things that he he got the you know so it was always one of those things that would be like, hey, that's fan artist Hugo winner Steve Styles. <laughs> he gets um, to put that in his bio. Yeah, that's that's mm-hmm. part and, of it, right? And you know, we we'd see him, and it's like Steve Styles Hugo Award winner. You know, Hugo Award winning Steve Styles, and you know he he knew it was all in good fun, and he was just happy. That's um, cool. yeah. So it was one of it was one of those, it was one of those good things that came out of 
out of that mess is it's somebody who had been there for fandom for decades, um, finally got his Hugo. Right. And that's, and the Hugos are for people that aren't really familiar that you mentioned earlier, that it's kind of like the, the Oscars for, um, for science fiction and that, it does seem to be that seems to be the case because they're um you know the longest running major awards as far as i know they're they're kind of um recognized as that that's now and there are other you know oh yeah absolutely very valid and very prestigious awards out there um oh yeah absolutely the locust awards the world mm-hmm. fantasy award nebulas the dragon award is, is nebula awards for you know so there's plus there's you know there's um the, uh, the new slate of uh, the ignite awards that just uh, they just um, right yeah the fire and then there's like you know the, the aurora awards i think in canada mm-hmm. the you know so there's a bunch of amazing awards out there that recognize people uh and then you know a lot of one of the other things there's a lot of great local conventions that give out awards too right yeah that's true um, it, uh, you guys just have a, a certain sort of long-standing prestige and cachet to them which is really uh but yeah 50 yeah, it's you pretty know dr- continuous since like 54 Mm-hmm. It was starting fifty three. I think they took a year off, and then they have been continuing since like fifty five or something like that. Um, there's, a whole, there's a whole banquet too, right? Like the there I, used I, to be. Uh, well, there wasn't this year. It wasn't wasn't much of a no. Banquet no. Um, <laughs> the last banquet was actually in Baltimore. In that was what was that, dear? 1983. <laughs> my <laughs> wife's saving my again. Um, no, is, it just, so, is it just a ceremony now then? Because I was, yeah, I it's just a ceremony. That, okay, so I'm just using the wrong term here. So it, there yeah, is no. an award ceremony that people could expect to go to if they were to attend. Oh, what? absolutely. Um, no, so great story from uh, um, the con chair was Michael Walsh, and it was the last. Um, it was the last time they did it. It was one of those things that cost wise and trying to arrange the space it just got to be too much mm. but it was baltimore so mm. they had crabs <laughs> and there were crab mallets and everybody was banging their <laughs> crab mallets um there's still some, i've actually seen some of the mallets um there's a few people who still have them so they they did it um it, it was one of those things it was it was it was fun but it, it just for the size of world kind of just it mm-hmm. became unmanageable it's not cost efficient yeah so, so now it's a ceremony that uh, and you have uh so there's a lot more focus on the the nominees and the eventual winners and mm-hmm. i guess I say finalists not just nominees because um finalists yes yeah finalists and the and the winners and also the hosts too we know uh, we were really yeah. happy pretty excited to hear who your uh host for the hugos are this year one of whom is our actual first podcast guest that we had on glitchy pancakes sheree renee mm-hmm. thomas oh <laughs> Oh, she is amazing she is yes, one of them um we I, I got a first chance to really hang out with her was at world fantasy actually last year in uh los angeles and we ha- got a chance to sit down and have lunch mm-hmm. and she just has a personality <laughs> um just it, it, it's like but the sun doesn't quite explain it mm-hmm. right <laughs> um so, you know, and like the other thing is like Malka Older, who's our other uh, host, yes. um, was in D.C. and got a chance to hang out with her a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. She did a reading at one of the local bookstores and we chalked. And it's like, OK, yeah, this, she's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was one of the most exciting things we saw after the uh, after this past World Con, where we saw it was within a week. I think you made the announcement uh, via the via the discount site. And Twitter and everything about your your Hugo host and that just uh, that was the tweet of the day right there. Everybody mm-hmm. was like, "Yes, hell yes, great choice." Well, the funny the funny thing is is that um, Sharia and I, I, we always have you have backdoor conversations going on, and Sharia's like, "They didn't just come up and like, no, this has been in the work for weeks. They just didn't want to they didn't want to jump on the this year's World Con. They wanted to do it afterwards. So we had agreement. Mm-hmm. We just." we were holding the announcement till after as kind of a big thing, or mm-hmm. we were, we were, we had planned to announce it. We had actually discussed announcing it at the um, closing ceremonies. Mm, wow. It was kind of our way to, you know, we were going to do it there and then everything's like, well, let's, well, yeah, let's, uh, we'll just not do that. Take a little um, space right there at the end. Yeah. And you know, like the thing is that George's presentation mm-hmm. would have been fine if we were in person um it would there have been some the screw-ups on the names and it would happen that would suck 
Um, but the thing is, let's face it, New Zealand got George as a Toastmaster because George is the biggest name or one mm-hmm. of the biggest names we have in science fiction fantasy right now. And he would draw people to that convention mm. from all over New Zealand, bring over people from Australia and nearby. Uh, you know, as a, as a, you know, as a planning thing, he would, his, his, his presence add something. Right. And it, you know, it, things happened and it did not go well. It did not go well. And it's, it's unfortunate because like you said, it is, uh, there were a lot of people, you know, this was uh, the first one that's been in New Zealand and, you know, there people look forward to this every year. And even though it was, you know, it was all virtual, it's still um, one of the things that has been really good to see in Hugo's um, and especially in Hugo's recently, the last few years is that there has been more of a focus toward um, really being inclusive of the entirety of fandom, which is something that you mentioned earlier, really wanting to put on an event that re- represents the, you know, the whole spectrum of fandom. And then, um, yeah, so that obviously upset a lot of people to see that it, it, what appeared to be a, a disregard for um, other, other, other cultures, perhaps it, it, that didn't go over well, but. Um, yeah, and <laughs> I think part of the, the issue is that you've got, you've got somebody who likes to tell stories mm-hmm. about his time in fandom. Right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm, I'm here, I'm throwing some stories out and stuff like that too. Um, you know, the thing is we had our local convention Capclave had George as guest of honor in 2013. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, our convention typically is about 300 people. Mm-hmm. We had 900 people. Wow. Come through that year. Right. To see George. We mm-hmm. literally, we scheduled, he did a signing on Saturday evening and a Saturday, Sunday afternoon as like one of the last items. We had people show up at 2 p.m. for that last item, pay $20 to walk in and we're like, hey, you want to go to the concert? We get a soda. We got some snacks. We're closing up, but feel free to grab some stuff. I'm like, no, nah, we're just going to get a signature. Right. And, you know, and it was, it was just like, okay, you know, we, you know, we try. But like, it was one of those things that um, we had a, um, we set up a, a special program thing. I, I actually ended up stepping up and having to program that year for our convention because we knew we were going to have more people and I wanted to make sure that everybody who attended got a Capclave experience. Mm, right. And we're a small literary convention that's very friendly, very open, and you people you get to hang out and talk with people. Um, and we knew we were going to have a lot of new people to fandom who were first convention attending. Right. Mm-hmm. So... Me being me, um, I got a hold of uh, Rachel Swirsky, who was the vice president of the Science Fiction Writers of America at the time. Yeah. And I said, Rachel, we've got, we've got a whole bunch of new people coming in. Do you have somebody on the board who's in the area who can come and give a little talk to people about etiquette, codes of conduct, behavior? And... Cause I mean, I, we've got Bud here who's on the board, but I don't think Bud's the right person for that. And she's like, yeah, no, no definitely not. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, she got uh, Eugene Meyer, who's an author out of Philly, who came down for one night to do a presentation. So we had a code of conduct behavior talk scheduled for 7 p.m. Um, on Friday night um, in the big room. Eugene is, of course, expecting, you know, like, 20 people may be able to show up. Um, we announced that um, we would not be clearing rooms in between panels. And George was on for his first item at 8 p.m. in that room. So there were about <laughs> 250 to 300 people who listened to, listened to Eugene Meyer talk about how to behave at a convention. <laughs> Which is important and, knowledge. That's yeah, yeah. conversation. Strategic programming. <laughs> what that's called. Exactly. It is, so it is. Be there to listen. Got it people is. to listen, and right. you know, and people had a good experience. Um, and then, well, you know, we had um, at the time Gardner Jerzois was still alive. Great yeah. friends. They'd done George and him done lots of anthologies, and uh, Gardner was coming down from Philadelphia. We arranged for Howard Waldrop, who's great friends, who's down ah, in Texas. Was fantastic. Um, great friends with um, with with George to come up. So Saturday night after our award ceremony for our local award, 
we had what we called the George Howard and Gardner show where the three of them talked about their lives and experiences in fandom mm-hmm. for two hours. Hmm. It, it was not safe for work. Oh, I'm <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, they, 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 the thing is they'd each done these kind of items with each other. It was the first time all three of them had actually had the chance to, to do it together. And we, uh, it was in Kansas city in 2016 and I walked up, I was in the Marriott hotel bar and I saw George and I walked up, Hey George, how you doing? And so we start chatting because we having worked with him and stuff for cap clay program and stuff, we got to know each other. So, you know, like we see each other at world cons and we chat and he, uh, he looked at me and he said, you know, that panel we did, it's one of the best panels, probably the best panel I've ever done. Um, that was, thank you. And yeah. we actually had arranged, so we actually recorded that. And if you look on YouTube on for fast forward TV has it, uh, George Howard and Gardner show. Um, it, it, you can still find it there. And when Gardner just walked past, when George was talking about it, he went ahead and he actually put a link to that, that talk as yeah. something to, for people as a remembrance mm. for their friendship. And for two hours, the people who were there got to be a part of their friendship. And it was, it was a special moment for a lot of people. It really seems like it. Yeah. That's, I know uh, Gardner in particular was uh, the, the anthologies that he edited were oh, amazing. Yeah. I think that was, that was probably as a young kid, the main thing that made me a, a hardcore science fiction fan was coming across those anthologies. Like I, I reckon, I remember that name from the front of some of the first books that I reread over and over again, because they were just such great collections. <laughs> so my, 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 my Gardner story is it was, I think um, warriors had come out not too long ago and we were at, a, we were at a world con and we were talking a little bit. And I'm like, you know, the warriors collection that was amazing there was not a miss every story was amazing that was in that but i gotta admit there was one story that was kind of a stretch on the theme it's like but it was robert block <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like yeah but i'm still i was like he's like yes i know it was a stretch but damn it it was robert block so i don't care <laughs> there it is it's <laughs> yeah that's uh and i'm gonna check out that um that panel with the three of them because howard's mm-hmm. really entertaining i actually saw oh, god he's hilarious first convention i ever went to was uh I, that's what made me love conventions is i got to meet I ran into him in the hallway at a little con in texas you uh, ran into howard and he talked to you a little bit like that <laughs> a little bit yeah. <laughs> um uh, so you- my my howard story is um we were oh god the howard one i'm trying to it's it was right there, and now it's it's jumped out of my mind. I hate when that happens. Um, oh, so after Capclave 2013, I'm doing the responsible thing as a chair because uh, I was coming up to be I was a 2014 chair. So I'm 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 going through the blog roll to see what people are saying and you know, positive, negative stuff, trying to see to make sure we're we're there. And so I'm reading blogs, and I'm reading this one. It probably a early 20 college age woman is writing about she went to cap it was amazing and she saw this reading and she has this new phase of her offer he's hilarious funny all this stuff she's gushing about howard waldrop <laughs> who's this like 60 something year old little texas guy and he but i mean he is he's a special reader um and yeah. just super open and friendly but like it's just funny you see somebody who's in their 20s who had this connection with somebody who's much a totally different generation and set of experiences. And that's a, that's a cool thing. And actually an interesting uh, point that I wanted to get to, because you mentioned how, yeah, George is someone uh, who likes to tell a lot of stories about his time in fandom. Cause he's all, he's got a long time in fandom. And the, the tendency is when people have been going to conventions and doing these sort of things and even, you know, being on convention staffs or even being authors that go to a lot of mm-hmm. conventions, they, they develop a lot of stories and there, there tends to be that sort of, um, you know, there's, there, there are in jokes and old stories oh, yeah, and, absolutely. and names of people that, you know, that they all know and things like that. Um, but you mentioned the, the connection of someone younger and newer to fandom uh, coming in because the, 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 the fandom of science fiction, fantasy, horror, comics, gaming, mm-hmm. the whole thing mm-hmm. is becoming a lot more. There's a lot more crossover between fandoms. There are a lot more younger fans coming into it, coming from a lot of different routes, uh, a lot of different backgrounds. Mm-hmm. So that uh, 
in my mind is, is a key thing for the future of fandom is to there, there's always going to be a place for those funny stories and, and everyone's always, that's always going to be entertaining. And I'd never miss a panel with Howard and Gardner and, and George Martin on it. I would, I would absolutely wouldn't miss that. But, um, well, but the other thing is you've got, there's some hilarious people in fandom. Yeah. Um, Connie Willis. Oh, she's great. Yeah. She is the, the lady dame of, of, of science fiction and fantasy. Mm-hmm. But she's got a wicked sense of humor, mm-hmm. and she's not afraid to to practical joke somebody. Right. <laughs> um, she was in Spokane, Washington, walking around, and you know those little cookies with like the the vanilla wafers and the chocolate inside. Uh, there's I, I can't yeah, think what they're called. Like those little sandwich cookies with the chocolate. Yeah, yeah. She convinced somebody that they. They were you, you wave those around and you make this weird sound that it would convince these. She basically somebody sent somebody on a snipe hunt in Spokane, <laughs> got them making weird noises and waving little cookies. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's one of the things that's really fun about uh, about the, the whole fandom world and the convention scene in particular is that there's so many things like that grow out of it. And I, I love the idea of more, you know, the the current generation, younger people getting, getting involved in it and being welcomed into it, which it sounds like. Well, and, you know, the thing is the people, they're really welcoming. Um, a few years ago, so the nebulas I helped at that were in Chicago, mm-hmm. um, that was when Three Body Problem was out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so Ken Liu was, was there and Lou Chichen was, was there. Sure. Literally fans who were Chinese American who spoke Chinese came to translate translate for Lou. Nice, yeah. Because that, cool. that that what people might not know about that we learned this from uh, Liz Gorinsky who edited it. She was uh, mm-hmm. our um, she was she was on the well we ha- we have an episode with her coming out re- uh, shortly. But uh, they one of the things we learned from that was was what a massive hit that book was in China before making it over here before it was before she helped oh, get it out there before Ken yeah. translated it. It was. I mean, it, not many people in the U.S. audience had heard of it, but it was a massive smash hit in China. Oh, a huge, huge hit! And let's face it, Chinese um, fiction is—it's really on the thing. You know, Neil Clark, working with uh, Clark's World and the translated issues they've had, have done a lot of things. Uh, helped, help, helped in the things, and there's communication with Storycom in China to try and bring U.S. story, you know, English stories into China and Chinese stories in, into the U.S. and English market. And, um, you know, but the thing is you get, you meet so many people and you know, people are friendly and you start to get to know each other. And like one of the cool things that happened is, so it's not a world con, it's world fantasy. Um, so we're down in San Antonio in 2017. So 2018 is our year. So like, I'm all, I'm like, okay, totally. What's going on? Is there anything going on? Is there something going to got to keep an eye on things? And there was a little kerfluffle on one of the panels between two of the women uh, on the panel and um, the winner of the Astounding Award, R.F. Kwong, was one of the people who was involved. So I actually went down and I found her in the bar and we started talking. I found out that she was at Georgetown. And this is before the Poppy Award come out. It was just going to, it was coming out. Um, it was coming out that next spring. And so like we, you know, got to talk and we actually ended up setting up and Rebecca did her first, one of her first readings was to the Washington Science Fiction Association. Oh, yeah. And, you know, like it went freaking windstorm the day she's doing it. So we're, we go out for dinner and, you know, a whole bunch of people didn't show up that were planning to come because it was just, I probably shouldn't have been driving, but, you know, <laughs> we were going to do this. And so, you know, it, like the thing is that, but then, so the, the, the reading went really well and we were like, everyone was just super impressed. And then, we know people up in Baltimore and they're like, Hey, do you think you could get Rebecca to come up and do a reading for us? Mm-hmm. So my wife and I end up picking up Rebecca and her mom who came up from Texas, <laughs> drove them up to Baltimore, had dinner with uh, a couple of, of fans. And then we went and she did the reading for them. She actually had gotten um, some extra art copies of the Poppy War that, um, she actually gave to the Baltimore science fiction society so they could read it and ended up, uh, ended up winning the Compton crook that yeah. year. 
Um, so it was like, and Compton Crook is like for the best first novel. Uh, sure. It's not the new writer. It's the best first novel. So you can have people whose first novel isn't until like 20 years into their career because they spent all that time doing short fiction. Right. So but the thing is, because of this one little incident, um, I got a chance to meet Rebecca and we're friends now and we chat and we'll email mm-hmm. and stuff. And it was really cool seeing all her stuff when she went over to England to do study at Cambridge as well as um, Oxford. Yeah. So it, it's like you get, you get all these like these great little connections and like Connie. OK, yeah, I'm going back to the Connie Willis. Well, again, damn it. She's awesome. <laughs> so we're at the we're at the we're at the um, awards for the Nebula Awards in Chicago. And they, there are lots of receptions and stuff that happen there. And we're at the reception and kind of just get a little tired standing around and mingling. So see right. Connie's husband, Courtney, sitting over in the corner. And so we just had Connie as guest of honor at Cap Clay not long before that. So it's like, okay, so yes, my wife and I actually had our wedding reception at Cap Clave. <laughs> and Connie Willis was at my wedding reception. So nice. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, as were the Vandermeers, uh, Ann and Jeff. But uh, so like we're, we're there and we're sitting, so we're just, we go down and sit down and have a seat ch- and chat with Courtney and just have a nice conversation. Of course, well, Connie wanders over, then Nancy Cress wanders over and then a couple more. All of a sudden, like we look around and we're like, we're at the cool kids table. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the cool kids um, table just congregated. Yeah. yeah, and, you're, you're, yeah. And, and there's stories are going on and you're just, you're hearing it. It's just, you're, it's, you know, they're people. And yeah, sometimes true. people forget that, you know, you don't think that it's like, oh my God, it's, and it's like, yeah, it, it, but you know what? They're people. Right. They want to, you know, they want to talk about stuff besides their work. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's, that's the thing, you know, like when we picked up George from the, George in Paris, his wife from the airport to bring him up to the hotel, we talked, we talked about, we talked about books. Mm-hmm. We talk about football. We, you know, Packer fan, he's a Giants Jets fan. We, we, we talk about that. You know, you talk, you, know, you talk about things you just don't talk about. In his case, we don't talk about the books. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. We talk about the, we talk about the anthologies and things like that, but you don't, you don't talk about the books because right. he does that all the time. And he's heard enough from, he's heard enough from all of us about that. Um, yeah. And this was 2013. So <laughs> God, now, now it's really off limits. Yeah. So, I mean, the thing is that, you know, you get all these great moments. And I think that's one of the great things that can happen at Worldcon is there's lots of opportunities for interactions between people, fellow fans, professionals and fans, you know, or other other people who are coming in. Yeah. And, you know, that's that's uh, one of the things like, um, you know, you have moments where you, you get a little nervous about things. So we're in Dublin and We've just won, so we're announcing our, our guests of honor. Mm-hmm. And you know, Nancy Cress, everybody knows and respects Nancy Cress. Super, super about that. Um, and then we announced Tony Weisskopf, who's the editor at Bain. Right. And I admit to being a little nervous. Mm-hmm. Tony is totally deserving, amazing person. Um, great editor, done a lot of great things for bringing back classics as well as you know the the work the the, the typical mil- military science fiction work that is, comes out of Bain. They have some great great stuff, and I was a little nervous. And you know the, the cheers and the applause that broke out um, when she was announced was kind of that <laughs> moment, right. bit of a relief, yeah, because they're they're that's. Well, it's it, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I could see how that could be a little dicey to, uh, yeah, to announce. And I mean, that's because there is, there has been, uh, and that's one of the things I kind of wanted to touch on. That is, is that there has been um, a lot more effort, it seems, and not not necessarily every year, but there, there's a general trend toward um, trying to make sure that uh, some of the issues, the and, and might say recurring issues that have happened uh, at past World Cons especially with what, what people would see as, as frankly dropping the ball on, on a lot of social issues, um, yeah. racial and gender issues and uh, issues right. of national origin, things like that. Right. Um, so it, it does, it, it looks from everything that we've seen like Discon three, uh, you know, Worldcon next year is, uh, is making a real effort to 
remedy some of those problems and make sure that they don't become problems there. So what can you tell right. us about efforts in that direction? <laughs> so, you know, obviously part of that started uh, originally with thinking about who we're inviting for guests mm -hmm. and how, how people fit in. And then um, we acknowledged looking through, we're like, our, our, our staff, although we've got a decent male female ratio, we have some, um, we have some LBGQT plus people on staff are, we're, we were weak and we acknowledge we were weak on our persons of color, um, mm -hmm. as part of a committee, although it's the upper level area where we're weak there more so than, um, general staff, we've got more people in that. And part of that is, you know, it's a big ask. It is. For, for, yeah, there's yeah, a lot of time that people put in on it, it's a lot of it's a lot of um it's a lot of time and you want to make sure you're asking people because you know they can do the job. Right. Not because they're a ticky box. Right. Exactly. Because that would not only be insulting to them in the, in the sense of tokenizing them, but also because then you're, you don't want it to come off as like, I'm asking for your time and labor and effort uh, to do the work that I'm not going to do myself. Like there's, that can happen sometimes that where people Absolutely. are asked to do something because it's like, I don't know how to do it and I'm not going to figure it out. So since you're a person of color or a woman or whatever, you know, whatever you're looking for, you come in and do the work for me. And so it, it's, it sounds like you, you've been careful to try not to do that while well, that's, right. sure that your decision makers are an actually right. diverse group. And, and right. we, you know, we're, we're, we recognize our weaknesses and, you know, it's, so you try and find ways, you're trying to find ways to develop people, mm -hmm. um, give them opportunities. It, it's, you know, we were talking about it a little bit beforehand. Um, I, I kind of bemoaned how a couple years ago, your, your, your local convention, you know, <laughs> kind of stole a couple people, from our local convention to come down and do things for you. But the fact was that, um, you know, when Cerise Wright came to me and asked, what do you think I should do? I'm like, this is a great opportunity for you. You have to do this. Hmm. You know, I, I hated losing somebody who's so good on program. Right. But getting somebody the opportunity, getting somebody who gets the opportunity to help make their vision possible. You got to encourage that. Right, right. And I hate you a little bit for, for doing it, <laughs> but like, you know, it was not on purpose. I swear. No, absolutely. And I, I totally understand that, but it's like, you know, I got somebody, I, I hate losing my great people. Right. You know, and it, it happens because life happens and people can't make it, but you always want them there. But now and able to be, in order to be there, the thing is, and we've talked about it. We've hit the edges of it. The fact is Worldcon is expensive. Mm -hmm. there's there, there's no way to mince words on it right it, it, it's expensive it's you know you've got you know starting we although we have so you know we have a first time world con attendee rate which is like 60 percent or 70 percent of the full price which helps right um it, it's not quite enough mm -hmm. um so one of the things then this was uh my co-chair colette this is her her passion and if she was here, she'd, she'd be telling you uh, about why. But it led to um, creating an, an initiative called uh, Capitalize, uh, the D Discon 3 Fan Fund, which mm -hmm. is, you know, we, we started off, we seated, the convention itself seated uh, 20 memberships for people who are disadvantaged in some way or might not be able to make it there otherwise. Now, on top of that, um, We've had individuals, and I won't talk about how much, but both Colette and I put in a specific cash donation. We just won't talk about how much it was. Mm -hmm. but we each put in out of our own pockets. We put in seed money to make sure that that fund was going to start off in a reasonable amount. Right. And we know we'll, we're actually, I mean, uh, we'll be reaching out to some other organizations to do that. And this is a way to help get people there. Now, on a... On a more personal thing, one of the things that we've developed over the years recently, um, and it, it, it's, it's a great kind of a starter conversation piece is, um, uh, you know, actually, uh, to go back, one of the great things about conventions is 
most of them, at least science fiction conventions like Worldcon, everybody gets a name badge. Right. So you recognize a face, you can look down and see what their name is if you don't quite remember. Yep. Right. <laughs> and the other thing that's developed there is um, the badges, ribbons. Um, when you're bidding, you have ribbons with this, you know, ours was uh, DC in 2021. We had, you know, we had ribbons. Everybody's got ribbons that you attach and you get these long streamers of ribbons. We actually in uh, San Jose for Worldcon 76, there was a kid who was up on the second balcony who let out his stream of ribbons that hit the floor. <laughs> yeah. um, and so you got these ribbons, but one of the things we've that's developed is we get really brightly colored ones that say first world con. So oh, you yeah. can see somebody who's there for the first time mm -hmm. and there's people who will, you know, call, Hey, first world con, welcome. Where are you from? And, you know, people will definitely go out and like be ambassadors to try and be welcoming to new people so that the people who are coming there for the first time don't, if they're if they're there solo or a small group they're like oh you know hey somebody's okay maybe i'm developing a group um so that's one of those things where you're, you're trying to you're trying to build a community um one of the things a lot of world con old timers and long timers will say is hey welcome to the family mm. you know it's the it's the annual family reunion and we have we have we have the stupid fan feuds and family fights and stuff <laughs> that every family has but you know people are there we're passionate we care Mm -hmm. and you know we want we want everybody to come and feel welcome um uh, and that's and it, it seems that you do if i could uh, <laughs> wouldn't mind sorry about that. a few other things that were on your uh, on the website yeah that, sorry <laughs> that people are uh well, no i just wanted to i wanted to point out a few things just to make sure uh because yeah uh, make sure that people know about them because there are a few steps that it looks like you've taken yeah um to for one thing um listing uh, everyone's pronouns having their having um you know badges or uh, stickers available so that mm -hmm. people can write their own making that a, a visible thing um looks like you will be i see on the website it says you have publicly pledged that no panels will be both all white and all male um because frankly people appreciate that in my opinion now, i i will say that in that case um it may be that I think there's some things that if there's alternate sexualities, mm -hmm. that's still a different voice. Right. 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 Like, right. like I, I, you know, like that's, I want to be careful that we're, you know, like there, there's, you know, there are diversity comes in many forms and like, we right. make sure that, you know, the, the, the main thing is that, yeah, we're not, we're, we're, we're the plan is not to have the crusty old white guy panel. Right. That being right. the general, the, the general motivation, which I think, again, people will appreciate. I see also, well, uh, like I gotta, I gotta be honest. A part of me really wants to have the crusty old white guy, you know, old white guys, yellow clouds panel. Um, you actually you know, call it that. Like if you yeah, actually literally, that's panel. what you call it. <laughs> you know, yelling at clouds, get off my lawn, yelling at clouds. Right. Uh, I see also that you're providing uh, captioning and ASL interpretation for the Hugo's, the master yeah. opening and closing ceremonies and the business meeting. Yeah, those are all pretty. Those have gotten pretty standard right. uh, recently, and yeah, we're you know we're looking and it, we're the um, uh, technology, of course, is, is advancing, and we're obviously we're live captioning the um, is is the plan. Mm -hmm. um, so that is, we'll have somebody who is who is literally there live captioning, typing, um, typing, not the not the automated stuff. Although with depending on where the technology's at, mm -hmm. we may have some, try to do some live captioning, auto ca live auto captioning in some program rooms mm -hmm. to improve accessibility. L cost wise, we can't afford to do, um, to have live, the live captioning, uh, the captioning going on in every room. Right. But the auto captioning will help. Right. Because there are people who, don't need a they don't they don't sign they don't need sign language but having the captioning available to them does help right mm -hmm. yeah it is significant so i, I would i'm going to uh, direct yeah. people for uh there, there's a, you have a long list here um if you go to the uh discon 3 website discon3.org um and go slash over slash about slash inclusion or under the about section <laughs> on uh on the web page you know it by heart of course you know it by heart I to direct people there, um, <laughs> I don't know quite as well as I do our work website, mm -hmm. you know, but work website, I you spend so much time on the actual output stuff that you know it well enough that I had our web 
went down. Mm-hmm. I was taking a phone call from somebody from the outside and I guided them to another office's material from memory. <laughs> Been entirely too much time on there. But yeah, <laughs> uh, I know that people are uh, definitely, uh, pe- people who want to be guests and people who want to attend conventions are definitely making a, a taking a, a lot closer look at, at what efforts, um, like you said, that Codes are of conduct. rather than reactive, um, right. the efforts toward inclusion. So yeah, anybody who's uh, listening and wants to check out what Discon 3, uh, what next year's Worldcon is doing, discon3.org, as he said, slash about slash inclusion. There's a very detailed <laughs> list there. And I think anyone would be interested in, in checking it out and seeing what they're doing. So, and, uh, and also pay attention because we'll be, you know, we're, it'll be just around the corner for people who might want to be on program. Um, and yeah. it's not just authors who are on program, scientists. Um, if you've got something unique to talk about, we may want you. Because, <laughs> you know, like it, people are interested in all sorts of things. And, you know, science presentations are something that we do. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've had, um, you know, we've seen some great presentations on like uh, artificial intelligence. Um, you know, the, I've, there's one that the fusion reactions. And so like, there's some really cool things like that, that, you know, if you've got knowledge there, we want it. We want to want to be able to talk about it. We want to share that information with people. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds interesting. I'm actually, that's something I didn't really know about Worldcon is, is the science content. That's a, and there's, there is a lot more, um, you know, a lot of people do know about, about the Hugos, but this is, this, this is, is it four days or three days? Five. Five days. So five days and it's <laughs> full featured programming. There's a ton of stuff to do. Um, if you're a fan of this, this kind of stuff. Um, and so before we wrap up, is there anything <laughs> else that you would just want people to know about Worldcon? Like why should they, why should people go? What's well? So first, we should say we are August twenty fifth through the 29th of twenty twenty one in Washington D.C. Uh, currently scheduled for the Marriott Wardman Park and Omni Shoreham, which are a few blocks from National Zoo, right on the Red Line at the Woodley Park Station. So that's five days. We'll have some events that are going on, um, things in the lead up in the first couple of days, and people who are planning to come in. We're the week before Dragon Con, so if you want to want to schedule, you come in. You can plan to stay a couple extra days on some shoulder nights, and then travel down on Tuesday or Wednesday, go down to Atlanta for Dragon Con. Um, you know, we're we we know how people are. Yeah, it's a big a big a big trip and a swing, but for some people, it's a great great way to spend a week and a half or two weeks with a bunch of friends. Yeah. Um, sorry, that was my my plug about the dates. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, this is this is an opportunity to, to, to get out there and meet people. Um, mm-hmm. one of, and you know, it, it's a little bit, there's a little bit for everyone. We hope it sounds like it. I mean, over you know, we haven't even, we haven't even talked about gaming. Yeah. Uh, right. there, you know, there's gaming that goes on. Uh, the, there's a huge gaming convention that happens in the, the area at the, uh, usually in uh, January at the, out at the uh, national Harbor, Mm-hmm. Um, and we're going to work with them to get some of their arcade machines to set up. Oh, uh, cool. Um, yeah. So you got, you know, arcade games, you've got board games. We have some tournaments, you may have some council gaming. So some, some of those things. And then, you know, there's music programming. There's, yeah. there's the people who like Filk is science fiction music. Mm-hmm. Um, we actually, we're working, we're planning to have the Washington Gamer Symphony Orchestra. Doing some uh, that sounds fun. In the course That's of the convention. Cool. So, you know, the music performances, there have been plays that have been done. I don't know that we're on that track. Um, you know, the thing is, each one kind of finds their fun thing. You know, each world con finds its own kind of local flavor mm-hmm. type thing. And, and they do, they, they, they match it. You know, there's, we're hoping, you know, we can be live and we can do some of the exhibits that we want to do. Uh, there's, you know, exhibit halls you get a chance to walk through and see things and of course you know there's book dealers clothing dealers yep. um you know just little fun trade items things like that so there's all sorts of things for people to shop and then plus well you know the, there's amazing there'll be an amazing art show the art show is great yeah mm-hmm. it's just, there's gonna be i mean over the course of five days there will be more stuff than anybody could could even possibly <laughs> right. uh, well yeah and you know because there'll be 10 plus tracks of activities going on every hour it's basically impossible to see everything 
And then, of course, you run into people, you meet people, you start having a great conversation. And, well, you know, sometimes that program isn't quite as, as good as the conversation I'm having. Um, and, you know, we're, one, you know, we're also looking at um, the properties we uh, are contracted with have, they're willing to let us use some of their lawn space to set up like a beer garden. Nice. Or, you know, try to bring in um, some, there's a lot of microbreweries. All right, you're you're likely to find me there. <laughs> you know, so we're trying we're trying to do that stuff. Now, one of the, some of the fun things, you know, one of the things looking forward to is part of the whole thing is there's a cost and to come and we we've talked about it. We kind of started joking about it, but we might do a charity dunk tank. Uh, <laughs> that sounds okay. Cool. You'll find me there. <laughs> all the all the money, all the money that is for donations that go to dunk people will go straight to helping people attend the next World Cup. That's cool. And that's great. Like that's those, really those kind cool. of efforts to and be the, able to get more people to go and be yeah. Able to and we, uh, Shycon Sevens Chair Dave McCarty, who is a big personality and has lots of friends, <laughs> has agreed to go first. And we're going to auction the first ball off. We don't know how much money we'll make. We don't know how <laughs> much uh, the Shycon Eight Chair Helen Montgomery is willing to pay to dunk Dave, um, <laughs> but. You know, I, I if we show up and see. <laughs> yeah, if if I'm there, if we're there, if we're able to do it, I will. I will be one of the people who goes up there. And you know, Dave's only requirement is he gets to razz people throwing balls. And I'm like, well, it's a dunk tank. <laughs> <laughs> what else would you do? Oh man, that's well, that's sounding awesome. And uh, this... holy cow, how long have we been going? <laughs> well, like we say, we set it up top. We warned everybody. Right. You get convention runners talking conventions. This kind of thing's going to happen. But uh, no, it's it is, it's sounding really awesome. It sounds like you guys yeah. are a, a great team and a lot of good stuff planned. It's uh, that's Discon Three. Uh, the website is Discon Three dot org. Um, that is the that's numeral three. That's numeral three, not three T H R E E written out. So just kind yes, of new- exactly. Thank you for clarifying. D I S C O N number three. <laughs> <dot org. laughs> That's August 25th to 29th of next year in Washington, DC. Uh, Bill Lahorn, thank you so much for no joining problem. us and telling everybody all about the upcoming world con. We're really looking forward yes. to it. Um, and here's, here's hoping that we actually get to uh, have it next year and everyone stay safe and, and get, keep your masks on and, yeah. And let's kick this thing in the butt and uh, get back to going to cons and enjoying ourselves. Yes, hopefully. Just remember, hope- uh, be safe. You know, mm-hmm. wear your masks. It, yeah. it helps. Um, yes, it really helps. And like, gotta- you know, it's it's always one of those things. I just I saw on Facebook today a friend of mine who's in Philadelphia, who, let's face it, he's had all the comorbidity issues including a kidney transplant oh wow and he he just announced that he's passed the worst of the COVID. he caught covid and he's passed the worst of it right and you know it's one of those things that it's not just you man right um it's 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 other people so you know wear the masks and hey, yeah, he if you wrote. want a Discon Three mask? We do have them at That's Off right, World Designs. <laughs> Off World Designs. It's actually really cool. Yeah. It looks like we looked at bills before the episode. It actually really is cool. So check that out. Well, thank you everybody for joining us for another episode of Glitchy Pancakes. Hope you enjoyed listening. Uh, Allie couldn't join us today, unfortunately, yes. but she says hi to you all. <laughs> um, hope you've enjoyed yourselves. Find us online at uh, stream the episodes if you want directly from GlitchyPancakes.com or get them wherever you get your podcasts. Um, Twitter and Facebook at Glitchy That's Pancakes. Right. If you have questions, suggestions, comments, email us at cakespod at gmail. Uh, Rob, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter at EI Blackout. That's I A I B L A C K O U T. I'm on Facebook. It's Rob Gilmore. And um, you can also find Glitchy Pancakes episodes on YouTube as well. We have a there a visual. We have a couple of things going on there. Um, there's a backlog of our, our, um, podcasts and videos you can take a look at and we hope you enjoyed this one uh again thank you to bill for for giving up your time and and explaining these things to us um and jesse where can we find you online my friend i am on uh when i get on there at on twitter at uh, jesse underscore a underscore adams um and if you like the podcast don't forget to subscribe maybe leave us a review if you can those are very helpful um check out again discon3.org and find them on twitter and elsewhere 
um, and definitely keep up with what they're doing because it's some pretty cool stuff. And if you haven't been to a world con before next year, Please will be a great go. start. That's right. And Bill, what can we find you if we're, if we're looking for you online? Crying in the corner. <laughs> that's, that's, um, fair. that's fair. That's fair enough. Sh- sh- shivering. <laughs> no one's going to get me. No one's going to get me. Um, I, I, I uh, um, you can find me, uh, WMS Lawhorn, uh, L A W H O R N at, 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 for Twitter. And that's, I, that is my main thing. I do that. Right. Although, um, for those of you who enjoy reading books, um, you can find a few of my review book reviews on S F R E V U dot com oh, okay. and we'll have that in the show notes we have that in show notes yeah. as well we'll have it yeah sf review um nice nice uh nice little organization they feed my book habit um <laughs> somebody's got to right right oh my <laughs> god <laughs> we'll put all that in the uh, in the episode notes so everyone will be able to find but, or or you find me in the corner reading uh my kindle unlimited right now um really put a plug out for the kindle unlimited because i really enjoy that as a service all right. I find a lot of great stuff. Um, a lot of great stuff. Yeah. I, I be, I've become a big fan of the lit RPG novels. Okay. okay. All right. We might have to <laughs> do a whole episode on lit RPG, actually. That is a whole right. thing. Yeah. Oh, God. I actually, I have to. The, there's a. I haven't gotten it to yet, but I've got saved uh, Wuxia, the W U X I A, which is basically Wuxia. it's Chinese martial arts. Yes. Stories. Okay. Um, well, yeah, I think there's like there's um, yeah, they make they make movies um based on them as well, and they're gonna have like a video game I think coming out soon um that involves uh Son Goku, uh, the, the Monkey King. Uh, right. Uh, uh, um, Jing Song, I think the Legend of the Condor Condor Heroes mm-hmm, yes. is 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 being that was written in like the fifties. Yes, and it's just being released in English now. Right, and right. I've been reading those, and they're amazing. See, there it is. That, that's what I was oh, waiting God. for because right, right at the end, it's never a glitchy pancake <laughs> episode is. unless we add something to our towering, <laughs> right. teary, ridiculous TBR files. <laughs> right, our You're mission right. is to destroy the TBR files. Of tradition. All of hey, it is tradition. Me, hey, I, I can say though, though, those are those are those are amazing. They're a lot of fun, um, and it, it's one of those things that, like, I, you know, I, I've watched some of the old. I'd watch some of the Chinese things where where there'd been the martial arts stuff. Um, right, the epics. Martial arts before, and the epics. Um, right. We didn't even talk about we're, we're South Korean. We are going to now. We're, we're going to. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't even talked about South Korean freaking SF dramas and oh, comedies. I mean. Uh, Google. Uh, can see, we just got to take notes. We got to take notes and put them oh, down. We got to have these in a Black is, whole uh, conversation about them. It, I mean, it's it's subtitled, but Black yeah. is freaking amazing. Yeah, we're gonna have to have him back, Jesse. Yeah, we're gonna have, have to come back and talk about. We're have him back and talk about all of this. We're definitely gonna have him back. All right. Uh, yeah. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> at some point we have to. Yeah, we have to. Thank you, everybody. We appreciate it very much, and we will see you on the next one. Good night, all. Yeah, take it easy. Good night. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there. Good night.